Hi. Today we're going to talk about DNA replication. I designed the lecture in such a way that we have um, a combination of animations and uh, a more standard PowerPoint presentation of the subject. So hopefully you'll find what works for you. Remember to prepare questions for question time and here comes a voiceover. DNA replication is one of the most fundamental processes in biology. It is necessary to maintain the integrity of the genome during cell division. Mistakes in DNA replication can lead to disease but are also drivers of evolution. Today we are going to discuss how DNA replication occurs. The central dogma of molecular biology is a concept we've discussed multiple times. DNA is the repository of genetic information. That genetic information is expressed during the transcription of RNA and the translation of RNA into protein. It is essential that DNA is replicated properly. After the discovery of the structure of DNA, different models of DNA replication were pr proposed. One model is conservative replication. In this model, the entire double-stranded DNA molecule serves as a template for a whole new molecule of DNA, and the original DNA is fully conserved, and you can see this in A. Dispersive replication is a very creative and somewhat unlikely model, where both nucleotide strands break down into fragments and then somehow reassemble. This leads to a new DNA molecule that have fragments of old and new DNA, but somehow have the correct sequence. A third model is semi-conservative replication. Here, the two nucleotide strands unwind and each serves as a template for a new DNA molecule. Messelson and Stahl needed a way to distinguish old and new DNA to help figure out which of these models was correct. To do this, they grew bacteria in medium that contained two isotopes of nitrogen. One that was heavy, nitrogen 15, and the other one that was lighter, nitrogen 14. When the bacteria grew in this medium, they would incorporate the radioactive nitrogen into their DNA. Then you can separate the DNA using an equilibrium density gradient that is put under centrifugation. They would uh, centrifuge the samples for quite a while, up to two days, and then they would get a band of DNA containing the lighter nitrogen on top and the DNA containing the heavier nitrogen on the bottom. So these are their actual results. You can't distinguish between the conservative and the semi-conservative model at this stage because the bacteria are grown only in the heavy nitrogen. But then when you switch the medium, for the conservative model, you would get the first doubling. So you would get one band of simply uh, heavy DNA and then one band of light DNA. Under the semi-conservative model, you would get one type of band that would be somewhere in between the heavy and light. And that's what you see at the right. You see a band that corresponds to a DNA molecule that contains one strand that was made with heavy nitrogen and the other one that was made with light nitrogen. When the bacteria go through a second doubling, in the light nitrogen, you should see for both models two bands, but the types of those two bands are different. So you should see, a, for the conservative model, you should see just a heavy band, then just light bands, right? Because they've been grown in the lighter nitrogen now. In the semi-conservative model, you should also see the two bands, but you should see heavy light bands and light light bands. And then that's what they got in their actual results on the right. 
So this is how they prove the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. So what do you require to replicate DNA? You have to have a process that's accurate and fast with few or no errors. You need a single-stranded template to copy, and that's the semi-conservative model. You need all four types of deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates, the DNTPs. These are the building blocks. And you need enzymes that can read and assemble the DNA. And these include DNA polymerase, topoisomerase, DNA ligase, etc. So now I'm going to go through the different types of replication that exist. And we're going to focus first on what goes on in prokaryotes, and then we're going to apply that to what happens in eukaryotes. So one form of DNA replication is rolling cir circle replication. Rolling circle replication is a type of DNA replication that occurs in viruses and the F factor in E. coli, and this includes uh, plasmids and episomes. In rolling circle replication, replication is initiated by a break in one of the nucleotide strands. DNA synthesis begins at the three prime end of the broken strand, and the inner strand is used as a template. The five prime end of the broken strand is displaced. This cleavage releases a single-stranded linear DNA and a double-stranded circular DNA. The linear DNA may, may recircularize and serve as a template for the synthesis of another complementary strand. In this, the products of the rolling circle replication are multiple circular DNA molecules. Now this works well for plasmids and such, but this is not how larger circular chromosomes like the bacterial chromosome are replicated. The way that bacterial chromosomes are replicated is through theta replication. So replication begins at the origin of replication, which is marked here on the left, and then a replication fork forms and newly synthesized DNA is made inside this replication fork in what is called a replication bubble. And the replication continues until you go all the way around the circle and then you make two exact copies. And I'm going to show you here an electron micrograph of a uh, bacterial chromosome replicating. You can see the replication fork and the origin and the replication bubble that is formed and then in time you get two large circular chromosomes. And now I'm going to show you an overview of how prokaryotic DNA replication occurs. The initiation of replication requires a particular DNA sequence called the origin. This sequence is called ORIC in the E. coli chromosome. A protein called the initiator protein binds to ORIC and causes the DNA to unwind. Unwinding requires several proteins. The most crucial are DNA helicase, which breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold the two DNA strands together. single-strand binding proteins, which help maintain the DNA in the single-stranded state, and DNA gyrase, which reduces torsional strain. An enzyme called primase synthesizes short RNA primers to allow DNA synthesis to begin. DNA polymerase 3 synthesizes DNA, beginning with the free 3' prime hydroxyl group on the last RNA nucleotide of the primer. Because the two nucleotide strands of DNA are anti-parallel, 
Replication takes place continuously on one strand, the leading strand, and discontinuously on the other, the lagging strand. The short lengths of DNA produced by discontinuous replication of the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase 1 cuts out the RNA primer and uses 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase activity to replace the RNA nucleotides with DNA nucleotides. DNA ligase seals the NIC between the DNA added by DNA polymerase 3 and that added by DNA polymerase 1 without adding another nucleotide to the strand. Through these steps, the replication machinery of the cell uses the parental DNA as a template to synthesize the leading and lagging strands. So you've seen now in this theta model, there is an origin and a leading and lagging strands. And this, this concept we're going to get into in more detail. And also how there's unwinding of the DNA to allow this replication to occur. So there are four stages of DNA replication in E. coli. And this is also applies to eukaryotes, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. So there's initiation, unwinding, elongation, and termination. The process begins with initiation. Initiator proteins, such as DNA A, bind to the origin of replication here, ORI C, and cause a short stretch of the DNA to unwind. The unwinding allows the helicase and other single stranded binding proteins to attach to the single stranded DNA. The unwinding involves the DNA helicase binding to the lagging strand template at each replication fork and moves in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction along the strand, breaking the hydrogen bonds between the bases and moving the replication fork along. And this is the unwinding. Then this allows the single-stranded binding proteins to stabilize the exposed single-stranded DNA and prevent any secondary structure from forming, things like this. And the DNA gyrase, which is outside of the unwinding replication fork, relieves the strain on the DNA double helix, on the double-stranded conformation, uh, ahead of the replication fork. Elongation is the third stage of DNA synthesis. Once the replication fork has unwound and the single-stranded binding proteins are in place, you get a primase that synthesizes short stretches of RNA nucleotides, which provide a three-prime hydroxy group to which DNA polymerase can then add DNA nucleotides. And that RNA primer is shown in green. On the leading strand, where replication is continuous, a primer is required only at the 5' prime end of the newly synthesized strand. However, on the lagging strand, where replication is discontinuous, a new primer must be generated at the beginning of each Okazagi fragment and the lagging strand is um, created by a number of Okasagi fragments being created and then put together. And I'm going to show you this in an animation which is coming up. Elongation at the replication fork requires a few things. A helicase to unwind the DNA, single-stranded DNA binding proteins to protect the single nucleotide strands and prevent secondary structures. The topoisomerase gyrase to remove strain ahead of the replication fork. A primase to synthesize primers with a three prime hydroxyl group at the beginning of each DNA fragment. And DNA polymerase to synthesize the leading and lagging nucleotide strands. Here's a closer look of what's going on 
at the replication fork during elongation. You can see in the lagging strand you have discontinuous DNA synthesis with a number of Okazaki fragments, and at the leading strand you have continuous DNA synthesis, and the leading strand moves in the direction of the growth of the replication fork. For elongation to occur, DNA polymerases need a 3' hydroxyl group to build upon. The primase provides this by synthesizing short pieces of RNA that act as primers. The RNA polymerase doesn't need the hydroxyl group to add nucleotides like the DNA polymerase. The leading strand only needs one primer to initiate the synthesis since it's continuous, and the lagging strand needs many since it is discontinuous. And they are, these primers are put at the beginning of each Okazaki fragment. DNA polymerase 3 is the main enzyme for replication. It has 5 to 3 prime polymerase activity, which mean it means it adds new DNTPs in the 5 to 3 prime direction. And it has 3 to 5 prime exonuclease activity, so it can cor make corrections if the wrong base is inserted into the growing strand. So this is a proofreading, or it, it sort of corrects for errors as it is synthesizing. This polymerase is, has high processivity and synthesizes without releasing the template. So these combined functions lead to accuracy in, in synthesis. DNA polymerase 1 was the first polymerase discovered in E. coli. It has both 5 to 3 prime polymerase activity and 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity. And it also has 5 to 3 prime exonucleotide activity. And this allows it to remove our the RNA primers and replace them with the correct DNA nucleotides. That's the main function of DNA polymerase 1. There are other DNA polymerases that have other repair func functions. And now I'm going to show you a video of the bidirectional replication of DNA so you can see what I've been discussing in an animation form. Hopefully it'll be clearer for you. DNA replication begins at specific chromosomal sites called replication origins. At the origin, the DNA duplex is melted by specialized proteins, resulting in a replication bubble. DNA synthesis starts at the origin and proceeds bidirectionally. Two replication forks move outward in opposite directions. At each growing replication fork, two new DNA strands are made. The leading strand is synthesized continuously from a single RNA primer. It grows in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, the direction of replication fork movement. The lagging strand is copied discontinuously from multiple primers, resulting in a succession of Okazaki fragments. Although the direction of DNA synthesis is opposite replication fork movement, the overall direction of lagging strand growth is toward the replication fork. As replication proceeds, the RNA primer of the first Okazaki fragment is replaced by DNA. Then the lagging strand fragments are ligated together. Here is an animation of the coordination of the leading and lagging strands during DNA synthesis. DNA is replicated by continuous synthesis of a leading strand and discontinuous synthesis of a lagging strand. Coordination between leading and lagging strand synthesis is achieved by the dimerization of DNA polymerase molecules at the replication fork. The DNA polymerase dimer moves with the replication fork. The polymerase at the leading strand template remains attached to the DNA, synthesizing the leading strand continuously. The lagging strand polymerase initiates DNA synthesis at the fork from an RNA primer made by a primase complex. The polymerase elongates the lagging strand in a direction opposite the fork, 
but stays bound at the fork. As a result, the newly synthesized lagging strand fragment loops out between the polymerase and the fork. Once the polymerase completes an Okazaki fragment, it dissociates from the DNA template. A new primer is produced at the fork. The polymerase reassociates with the template at this position to continue synthesis of the lagging strand. By this mechanism, the two polymerases can add deoxyribonucleotides to the growing strands at the same time, and it rates up to 1,000 base pairs per second. And here is an animation of nucleotide polymerization. DNA polymerases catalyze the synthesis of new DNA strands from a DNA template. DNA polymerases require a pre-existing RNA or DNA strand, the primer, to initiate new DNA synthesis. These polymerases add deoxyribonucleotides only to the three prime end of a growing strand. Taking a closer look at the nucleotide polymerization reaction, the 3' prime end of the primer contains a free 3' prime hydroxyl group. The 3' prime hydroxyl reacts with the 5' prime end of the next free nucleotide to be added. Free nucleotides continue to be added to the growing DNA strand by the same type of reaction. Overall, the new DNA strand grows in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. DNA ligase is another important part of the DNA replication story. It repairs nicks in the DNA backbone and forms phosphodiester bonds without adding another nucleotide to the strand. So when DNA polymerase one replaces RNA with DNA, you are removing this RNA primer that was added by the primase and you are replacing it with DNA. The RNA replacement leaves a nick in the DNA strand DNA ligase repairs the NIC, and this is a very important function for this protein. The final stage of DNA replication is termination, and this can occur in two different ways. It can occur when two replication forks meet, or specific termination sequences can also block further replication. There are multiple mechanisms to ensure DNA replication fidelity. These include the selection of the, the correct nucleotide by the DNA polymerase, proofreading of the DNA that has been synthesized by the polymerase, and then mismatch repair. The fidelity of, of DNA polymerase is really good. The error rate is one in one billion nucleotides. And this is because of the proofreading activity. So wrong nucleotides inserted causes mispairing, the polymerase stalls, it excises the wrong nucleotide and replaces it with a correct one. And this takes place during replication. Mismatch repair is a second mechanism that takes place after replication. Deformity in the strands is repaired. So if they don't properly uh, base pair, you would see a bulge in the, the double-stranded DNA. For a mismatch repair to occur properly, you need to distinguish new strands from old strands, which is the correct template. So in prokaryotes, methylation lags behind replication, and the old strands are methylated, and the new ones are not. The mismatch repair occurs on the non-methylated strand. Here's a summary 
of what we've learned about DNA replication using the E. coli model. Replication is semi-conservative. New strands are generated from complementary templates provided by the old strands. Replication begins at origins of replication, and usually in prokaryotes there is only one, but this is not true in eukaryotes, where there are multiple. DNA synthesis requires a primase and RNA primers to begin. Leading and lagging strands are formed in the, during elongation. The lagging strand are, are made up of Okazaki fragments. There's a bidirectional elongation of the replication fork. But DNA synthesis always occurs in the 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. And DNA synthesis is fast and accurate due in part to proofreading and highly processive enzymes. Eukaryo eukaryotic DNA replication is slightly different than prokaryotic. It's similar, but, you know, there are some differences. This is because eukaryotes have much larger genomes, and this requires thousands of origins. There are origin recognition complexes, and these proteins bind to origins and unwind. There are multiple linear chromosomes versus usually one circular chromosome in eukaryotes. The DNA template is also associated with histones that form nucleosomes, which is not the case in prokaryotes. The nucleosomes assemble immediately following replication in eukaryotes. Given all these chromosomes, eukaryotic DNA replication is obviously more complex. There are these large linear chromosomes and it's too much DNA content to do theta replication like in prokaryotes. So you have multiple eukaryotic replicons that are approximately 20,000 to 300,000 base pairs long. It would be too slow to just use one replication fork given the fact that the polymerase works at a rate of approximately 500 to 5,000 base pairs a minute. These thousands of origins are necessary in order for the chromosomes to replicate fast enough. And here's a look at the number and length of replicons. So in E. coli, you have one origin of replication and you have a very large replicon, right? But in yeast, the fly, the frog, and the mouse, you have many more origins of replication. And these, the lengths of the replicon are of varying lengths here. So you can get a sense of the scale. Initiation in eukaryotes has two different steps. Step one, the replication licensing factor, this protein, attaches to the origin and then the origin becomes licensed. And then step two, an initiator protein separate the double-stranded DNA. Only licensed recognized origins, these proceed, only they proceed. Then the replication fork moves away and these factors fall off. So the origin then becomes no longer licensed, so replication cannot be initiated again. There are other things that are different. There, the unwinding is a little more complicated. It, there are several topoisomerases and single-stranded binding proteins that have similar functions to the ones in prokaryotes. There are multiple DNA polymerases, but they have different structures and different locations. Some are even found outside of the nucleus. 
For example, DNA polymerase gamma is involved in mitochondrial DNA replication and repair. There are translesion polymerases that have lower fidelity that can bypass lesions in the template and continue to replicate. And this is, may be important in cases where you have DNA damage, so your DNA damage. Overall, there are 13 to 15 different DNA polymerases in eukaryotic cells. This next video will show DNA replication in molecular detail and it draws upon the structural information that we have about the enzymes that make DNA replication possible. During DNA replication, both strands of the double helix act as templates for the formation of new DNA molecules. Copying occurs at a localized region called the replication fork, which is a Y-shaped structure where new DNA strands are synthesized by a multi-enzyme complex. Here, the DNA to be copied enters the complex from the left. One new strand is leaving at the top of frame, and the other new strand is leaving at the bottom. The first step in DNA replication is the separation of the two strands by an enzyme called helicase. This spins the incoming DNA to unravel it at 10,000 RPM in the case of bacterial systems. The separated strands are called 3' prime and 5', prime, distinguished by the direction in which their component nucleotides join up. The 3' prime DNA strand, also known as the leading strand, is diverted to a DNA polymerase and is used as a continuous template for the synthesis of the first daughter DNA helix. The other half of the DNA double helix, known as the lagging strand, has the opposite orientation and consequently requires a more complicated copying mechanism. As it emerges from the helicase, the lagging strand is organized into sections called Okazaki fragments. These are then presented to a second DNA polymerase enzyme in the preferred 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. These sections are then effectively synthesized backwards. When the copying is complete, the finished section is released and the next loop is drawn back for replication. Intricate as this mechanism appears, numerous components have been deliberately left out to avoid complete confusion. The exposed strands of single DNA are covered by protective binding proteins, and in some systems, multiple Okazaki fragments may be present. Bacterial chromosomes use the theta model of replication to duplicate their chromosome. Plasmids and some viruses use the rolling circle model. And eukaryotic chromosomes use this linear eukaryotic replication model. In theta replication, the DNA template is circular, there is no breakage of the nucleotide strand, and there's usually only one replicon because there's only one origin of replication. The replication can move in either a unidirectional or bidirectional way, and this produces two circular DNA molecules at the end. In rolling circle replication, the template is also circular, but it involves the breakage of the, one of the nucleotide strands. There is one replicon, and synthesis moves in one direction, and it produces one circular molecule and one linear molecule that could subsequently circularize. Linear eukaryotic chromosomes replicate based upon a linear DNA template, obviously. There is no breakage of the nucleotide strand, but there are many, many replicons. And the origin, from the origin, the elongation occurs in both directions. And at the end, this produces two linear molecules. 
replicating the ends of linear chromosomes has some difficulties. And this is resolved, these difficulties are dealt with by telomeres and telomerases. So at the end of the linear chromosome, there is a gap left by the removal of the RNA primer. And this can be filled in by that telomerase. And the telomerase interacts with the telomere. Telomeres have short repeat, repeated sequences and a, a protruding single strand. The telomerase, which is a ribonuclear protein, so it, it's a protein that has an RNA in it, is in itself an RNA template that extends the overhang. Cells that undergo continuous replication must have telomerases, such as germ cells, embryonic stem cells, and hematopoietic stem cells. Most other cells do not continuously replicate and therefore do not have high telomerase activity. So could, because these cells have a limited number of cell divisions, every time the cell divides, chromosomes would shorten and become unstable if telomerase was not present. Keeping telomeres of a certain length is important for genome sta stability. And now here's a video showing how telomerases work. The ends of linear chromosomes pose unique problems during DNA replication. Because DNA polymerases can only elongate from a free 3' hydroxyl group, the replication machinery builds the lagging strand by a backstitching mechanism. RNA primers provide 3' hydroxyl groups at regular intervals along the lagging strand template. Whereas the leading strand elongates continuously in the 5' to 3' direction all the way to the end of the template, the lagging strand stops short of the end. Even if a final RNA primer were built at the very end of the chromosome, the lagging strand still would not be complete. The final primer would provide a 3' hydroxyl group to synthesize DNA, but the primers would later need to be removed. The 3' hydroxyl groups on adjacent DNA fragments provide starting places for replacing the RNA with DNA. However, at the end of the chromosome, there is no 3' hydroxyl group available to prime DNA synthesis. Because of this inability to replicate the ends, chromosomes would progressively shorten during each replication cycle. This end replication problem is solved by the enzyme telomerase. The ends of chromosomes contain a G-rich series of repeats, called a telomere. Telomerase recognizes the tip of an existing repeat sequence. Using an RNA template within the enzyme, telomerase elongates the parental strand in the 5' to 3' direction and adds additional repeats as it moves down the parental strand. The lagging strand is then completed by DNA polymerase alpha, which carries a DNA primase as one of its subunits. In this way, the original information at the ends of linear chromosomes is completely copied in the new DNA. Telomeres may play a role in aging. Shortened telomeres eventually send signals to the cells that the cells are aging and, grow, and the cells no longer remain active or divide. Here are some genetic terms and concepts you should know. Semi-conservative replication. Replication in which the two nucleotide strands of DNA separate, each serving as a template for the synthesis of a new strand. All DNA replication is semi-conservative. Rolling circle replication. Replication of circular DNA that is initiated by a break in one of the nucleotide strands, producing a double-stranded circular DNA molecule and a single-stranded linear DNA molecule the latter of which may circularize and serve as a template for the synthesis of a complementary strand. 
DNA polymerase, an enzyme that synthesizes DNA. Leading strand, the DNA strand that is replicated continuously. Lagging strand, the DNA strand that is replicated discontinuously. Okazaki fragment, short stretch of newly synthesized DNA produced by discontinuous replication on the lagging strand. These fragments are eventually joined together. DNA helicase, an enzyme that unwinds double-stranded DNA by breaking hydrogen bonds. Primase, an enzyme that synthesizes a short stretch of RNA on a DNA template. Functions in replication to provide a 3' hydroxyl group for the attachment of a DNA nucleotide. Primer, short stretch of RNA on a DNA template. Provides a 3' hydroxyl group for the attachment of a DNA nucleotide at the initiation of replication. DNA ligase, an enzyme that catalyzes the formation of a phosphodiester bond between adjacent 3' hydroxyl groups and 5' phosphate groups in a DNA molecule. Telomerase, enzyme that is made up of both protein and RNA and replicates the ends, telomeres, of eukaryotic chromosomes. The RNA part of the enzyme has a template that is complementary to repeated sequences in the telomere and pairs with them, providing a template for the synthesis of additional copies of the repeats. DNA gyrase, an E. coli topoisomerase enzyme that relieves the torsional strain that builds up ahead of the replication fork. Proofreading. Ability of DNA polymerases to remove and replace incorrectly paired nucleotides in the course of replication. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Next time we will discuss transcription.